Now, when most eight-year-olds were playing with their cars and dolls and video games, I was toying around with computers and maps. Authentic, parchment, sometimes hand-drawn maps. I'll explain my logic behind this a little later. While my method of play was quite unorthodox for an inner-city kid at the time, the same might have been said for the rural kid, James Nightingale, who was using television remotes as something to hold in place of a real microphone when he imitated James Brown and Little Richard. As the youngest of six siblings, aspirations to be on a stage instead of out on the farm didn't exactly draw the applause of his parents as he would have hoped, especially his father, who was one of just a handful of artisan cheesemakers in the region who relied heavily on the help of his family for the business as he aged. But James, his family called him Jimmy, and then Jim, once he started growing a mustache, was always the different one in the family. A sensitive kid who'd rather spend his free time writing songs instead of roughhousing. Or instead of out on the football field, he'd be fooling around with the guitar or piano, both of which he taught himself how to play. Like everyone in his family, Jimmy's sun-baked, brown skin, curly black hair, and hazel eyes made him easy to remember once you met him. But unlike his two naturally athletic brothers, his frame was lean and his face was naturally angular, a picturesque structure that was evident even prior to puberty. Being a masterful musician, you know, the multi-hyphenate type with the commercial potential of a Bruno Mars, Jimmy was using the internet to build his name while winning singing competitions and fielding calls to sign on with managers and labels when he was barely 15 years old. So, of course, he eventually picked one. And there started his career and life away from the farm. Now, because this is a story about music, I'll share with you some of the details of Jimmy's five years as a semi-pro in the industry, which included one almost hit song that required lots of time on the road and an inexplicable amount of auditions for nationally televised competitions and Disney shows. This time also included lots and lots of sex much of which was well before he was ready, most of the time coercively. Other times with people who he wasn't at all interested in or even attracted to. This, of course, brought about pain. Physical, psychological, and mental pain, which then caused, of course, the need for pain killers. None of which were prescribed, though. Some to get up, others to come down, some only to be used sometimes. Others were used all the time. By 20, Jimmy was back home in Virginia by his own volition, this time committed to focusing solely on his music. But the habits he picked up, the ones he'd gotten used to using to numb the pain and temporarily erase the thoughts, especially the memories of his pre-adult life, didn't just go away once he was back home. Now, we've all seen those television singing shows and have been able to pick the Kelly Clarkson or the Jennifer Hudson because talent is apparent. The proverbial cream, as they say, always rises to the top. So despite his striking good looks, this time it was Jimmy's obvious gift for writing good songs, his velvety smooth vocals, along with his ridiculous range that had his phone ringing once again. This time... He was well aware of these people in the industry and that they were better at taking much more than they were at giving. Although he was from Leesburg, a few miles outside of D.C., the nation's capital still claimed him as one of its own, and he started his ascension to Internet prominence and indie fame. But although cream rises, it takes a lot to keep it on top. We've all seen or met that person who can't get out of their own way, and we just don't know why. 
We don't know about that experience they had as a teenager that causes them to self-sabotage or those thoughts they still can't erase that causes them to want to stay tranquilized. In January, Jimmy turned 23 years old. I wish that I could tell you that he's already gone on to achieve the fame and fortune of a Carrie Underwood, but he remains in a constant dance, taking two steps forward matching it with two steps back, struggling to find a way out of his own way. And not many people, not even his parents, not even his siblings, not his new manager, not even his closest friends, could tell you exactly why. But when Jimmy left as a teenager, a part of him, a really, really big part of him, never returned home. I'm Kayana Ebony Brown, and this is a story of music and men. You like funny stories? Picture a brown box. It's unassuming and unpretentious in its presentation, yet it's massive and it's statuesque. It sits on the corner of V and 9th Streets in Northwest. You would never know what goes on inside unless, of course, you already know what's going on inside. That's what you get from this D.C. landmark. It's a building. No signage, no windows, no impression that it even wants anything to do with you. Unless, of course, it opens up and lets you in. Now, on the inside, well, (laughs) that's another story because inside is a story. It's decades in the making. It's history, romance, drama, and action, all packed into a big brown box. Now today, it's a Washington monument right up there with Ben's Chili Bowl and maybe the White House. It's the place Alanis Morissette would rock when she was testing out those songs that ended up becoming Jagged Little Pill. This is where Dave Grohl wasn't THE Dave Grohl when he first blessed that stage, but just another kid from down the street who eventually got his shot with Dane Bramage, which was before Foo Fighters, before Nirvana, hell, even before his scream days. It's the place where Public Enemy gave a sneak preview of their eventual hit, 911 is a joke. Because I mean, of course, you know, only in 1989 was something like that the case. So, there I was, standing in front of the general manager of this epic joint, putting forth my best effort to try and become a part of this history. What better way to get on a person's good side than to tell them a story? I mean, especially one that contains something in it for them at the end. I've learned people in power always, always like it when there's something in it for them. And so, that is why I asked... You like funny stories? I didn't wait for her to reply before I went on. Uh, I don't mean funny like ha-ha type funny. I mean funny like serendipitous, you know, the meant-to-be type funny. The kind of funny that makes you believe that someone, somewhere, is looking out for you. She gave me her attention through squinted eyes that kind of made me a bit nervous. I mean, she might have been older than 50, but she looked active. And she was tall, and I wouldn't be surprised if I found out that she'd been a decent basketball player at one point in her life. The music geek in me naturally thought of Sue Sylvester from Glee, which actually didn't help the intimidation factor at all. But I took a quick breath and refocused my story. I mean, it was a good story. One with the kind of ending that might make me a lifelong friend in this woman. At least that's what I thought. I proceeded with confidence. Head up, shoulders back. So last night, an old mid-sized luxury sedan that had actually aged pretty well considering the mileage, it was cruising along Lime Kiln Road when suddenly it smashed right into a deer. I mean, or deer smashed into it. Either way, there was an accident. The driver wasn't hurt though, thank goodness. In fact, he got out of the car when he realized that it wasn't going to move because of the carcass trapped underneath it. I felt her impatience looming as she started to take a deep sigh. 
Wait, wait, it gets better though. So apparently someone called the cops because they got there in minutes and they immediately caught the stench of alcohol emanating from him with every single breath he took. I mean, he was less than a mile away from his house and they arrested him for driving under the influence. Do you believe that? <laughs> By the way, the deer didn't die from the hit, but the cop had to put it out of its misery. Got about 90 seconds. Wait, 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 wait. That driver was 23-year-old Jim Nightingale. I revealed, fighting the urge to smile as she stared at me for a moment before dropping her head with a deep sigh. <sighs> she obviously already knew what I was telling her. But now she knew that I knew. But I finished anyway. You know, good measure. Oh, yeah. He was also driving on a suspended license, so... Can't leave the state of Virginia anytime soon. Now, look, here's the funny part. Now, I mean, not ha-ha, but the other funny. Gavin DeGraw is going to be here this week. Without warning, she started walking away from me. But I felt like I had her on the ropes now. I was this close to getting what I'd come for, so I followed, walking closely behind her, still talking. And since Jim Nightingale is obviously going to be unavailable... How the hell do you know all that about Jim? She barked as she stopped and turned back to look at me. Her gaze, I'll admit, caused me to miss a breath. But I quickly recovered and came back with a body blow, dealt with a smile that showed absolutely no sign of weakness. I know a lot of things, like... I also know that Gavin DeGraw is going to be in Chicago the same day for another event. And according to my sources, the earliest he can get here to D.C. would be 6 p.m. Reagan, Dulles, BWI, no matter which airport he's flying into, there is no way he can get off a plane, get here, and be on that stage by 7 o'clock. And for a split second, she probably didn't even notice it, but I did. She looked down. And that is when I knew... I had her. All I had to do was go in for the knockout. And that's with perfect traffic. You need an opener. Nightingale is out. But someone, somewhere, is looking out for you. I couldn't read the look on her face, but I chose to think it was one of admiration. You know, she was a woman of power. I was on my way to being her coeval someday. I had played this whole thing flawlessly. So I stood there, refusing to break eye contact, as I waited for something like an old Atta girl, giving my approach to solving a problem for her that she didn't even know I knew she had. Now, I'm not usually this smug, so let me provide you with a bit of context so you know how I got here. Club. Sometime during one of the golden ages in music, an aspiring music mogul, who will just call Tom, fresh out of grad school, planted his feet firmly onto the yellow brick road, or better, the gum-stained asphalts we'll call the sidewalks of New York. Now, it wasn't long before Tom was embracing life in a quaint, overpriced Manhattan apartment. More nights out than in with the city that never sleeps. Really fine and embracing his new gig as an artist and repertoire rep at, mm, let's just call it Big Music Company. Those nights out on the town were actually part of the job as an A&R guy. Go to a few clubs, listen to a few voices. He was on the lookout for something with what he simply called, mm, it. It could come in any form. Him, her, tall, round, any form. Of course, except old. He never worked with anyone over the age 26. So let's say he found your typical cute, white, guitar-playing 19-year-old Joe Schmo on the stage in some dive bar getting panties thrown at him, literally and, of course, figuratively, but more so literally. Doesn't matter. If Tom liked him and thought he had it, then he figured you'd like him. So he'd invite him back to his office, introduce him to a few other Toms like himself. Then he would offer him coffee or water, along with a recording contract. He may or may not say the exact words, Sign this. It's the only way anybody will care about your music. 
but that'd surely be what he meant. So, Joe Schmo, smitten by the idea of being a star, now has Big Music Company working for him with all of its money, its power, its respect, their job to make sure you not only know Joe Schmo, but that you buy Joe Schmo. For ages, this was just the way business was done, the proverbial blueprint to music success. That is, until technology changed everything. Making music no longer required millions of dollars, thousands of hours, hundreds of people. In fact, folks no longer even needed stores to sell or get a hold of it. So, after one album that achieved the sales equivalent of plastic rather than platinum, Big Music Company would see absolutely no reason at all to continue working with a Joe Schmo. Because here's the thing. By the turn of the century, with just a few hundred bucks, a few hours, the help of a few friends, the same thing Joe signed his life over to Big Music Company to do could be done out of an apartment. <laughs> in fact, with so much of the business being done in apartments, dorm rooms, and coffee shops, Big Music Company eventually saw no reason to keep their offices staffed with so many Toms. Welcome to the age of digital supremacy. where vinyl records are more popular than ever, yet record stores are mere folkloric myth. And with that proverbial blueprint to doing business and music having long since crashed and burned, independent musicians continue to find ways to exploit their talent all by themselves. But to be successful, amateurs do need something, some kind of business or people or team of business people that can take care of all that other stuff while they're out there rapping and singing and playing all over the place, right? Now, if only there was such an infrastructure for this kind of thing. <laughs> Enter me. Equipped with a three-year-old laptop I just finished paying off three months ago, 300 square feet of my dad's basement, which I hijacked four years ago, which doubles as my home and my headquarters, armed with not much more than sheer will and a go-getter mentality. Now, believe it or not, I am Tom's dream. Now, back in the day, being signed to a record label would have meant that an artist had to sign their lives over to a big company. But today, this the three-year-old laptop, the 300-square-foot space, the girl with nothing but hustle, is the big music company. What Tom had, the money, the power, the team of other Toms imposing their will. <laughs> yeah, I don't have any of that. <laughs> no big office building either. I also don't have the luxury of being in the music city. And around here... <laughs> Lights are out, doors are locked, no, bolted shut by 2 a.m., so we can't claim to never sleep either. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Washington, D.C. The White House, monuments, museums, memorials, politics, I know, I know. Not exactly what comes to mind when you think of music. In fact, I really don't have any of the things I need to make my job easy. Then again, whoever said it was supposed to be. This episode of Of Music and Men was written and produced by me, Kayana, with express permission and the help of some of the most incredible indie artists in the world. For information on these artists and how you can support their efforts, 
visit the show notes in your podcast app or go to amusicandmen.com slash podcast and select this episode. We started out with Strangers by Legang from Sweden. Then we went on to I Knew a Guy by Kevin McLeod from right here in the USA. Lightness by No Men from France. Snowfall by Scott Buckley from Australia. Jazz Club by Chris from Italy. Trail by Nobara from Colombia by way of Japan. Supreme by J. Jin Music out of India. And finally, finally, this track is by Lox Beats from Greece. And of course, all of our promotional music is done by Khalil Ismael from right here in the USA. For information on these artists and how you can support their efforts, visit the show notes in your podcast app or go to amusicandmen.com slash podcast and select this episode. And if you would like to have your music featured on the show, check out our website for more information on how you can submit. Now remember, Of Music and Men is so much more than just this podcast. The novella series is available in online bookstores, and if you wish to have a physical copy, you can get it on our website. Of course, that's of musicandmen.com, where you can also get t-shirts and all other kinds of cool merch. Don't forget to subscribe at Apple, Stitcher, or wherever it is you're listening to this podcast. And remember to review and give us a five-star rating. Lastly, connect with us on Patreon where you can become a part of this project and its journey and help it to grow to everything it was meant to be. Follow Of Music and Men everywhere online at Of Music and Men. And when you do, please don't hesitate to reach out. Artists and entrepreneurs are a very unique type. We face lots of rejection, almost too often for comfort. So whether you're a seasoned business owner or creator, aspiring to be one, or you're simply just here to hear a great story, I want to always give you something to ponder until the next time. Today's words are from Mary Tyler Moore. Take chances, make mistakes, that's how you grow. Pain nourishes your courage. You have to fail in order to practice being brave. How are you practicing being brave? This episode was brought to you by Doctors To You, DC's most trusted house call medical service provider. What are you sitting around in a waiting room for, huh? Like, that's so old school, it's so 1990. You get your food delivered, you get everything from Amazon, Why not have your doctor come to you? It's no rush. Plus, you're in the comfort of your own home, dorm, or hotel room. No waiting room. Go to doctorstew.com to book your house call today. Next time on Of Music and Men. I have big dreams for my little company to be great someday. But not just dreams, actual plans to get it there. And I know what you're thinking. Another typical millennial girl, all career, no love life. And well, you're right. (laughs) But you know what? It's not my fault. Seriously, I have the perfect explanation for why, unfortunately, my plans for success in business don't actually translate to dating. Here's the thing that most people don't know. Our nation's capital has the lowest marriage rate in the country, but the highest number of same-sex couples. That means DC could literally be the gayest place in America. I mean, in order to find love, a single girl 
might have better luck finding, well, a single girl. But for those of us who prefer our mates be from Mars, shit, we might have to start going there to find them. Because when it comes to the game of love, the most powerful city on Earth is a forlorn underdog. All of this makes great fodder for my often self-indulgent social media rants where I chronicle my life's two greatest hurdles, music and men. It makes for even better lunch conversation, especially when the players are my closest friends. Now look, I must warn you before I introduce them that you will probably have never met two more contrasting figures before in all your life. Even my divorced parents weren't as opposing in personality as these two, although somehow Ty and Jay managed to remain rather close and relatively civil. Perhaps it was because they never had to live together. That usually helps. Today's lunch takes place at our favorite mutually agreeable place to both eat and take in the view of DC's array of similar hipster artsy folk, busboys and poets. 